Good morning. For those I've not had the chance to meet, my name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. On behalf of Mrs. Reagan and the Reagan Foundation Board of Trustees, and in particular, Bob Tuttle of our board, who has done so much to make this day a reality, I want to welcome all of you here on this historic anniversary of President Reagan's Westminster Address, and thank you for the honor of co-hosting what I know will be a memorable event. I know that throughout the day we're going to hear from some extraordinary experts who will help us take stock and place our 40th president's words and deeds of three decades ago into perspective. We'll assess how far we've come in strengthening democracy around the world and where we are in that mission in the context of today's times. I'm looking forward to hearing from all these speakers, all of whom are a lot more qualified than me to provide real insight on these issues throughout the day. But I thought it'd be important in welcoming you here to provide a very brief perspective, perhaps a unique one, on the evolution of President Reagan's Westminster Address that we have gathered here today to commemorate. First, for those who have not had the opportunity to see it, we have dug deep into the archives here at the Reagan Library and produced the actual copy of the speeches delivered by President Reagan to the British Parliament 30 years ago this week. You'll find it against the wall right over here uh, to my left, along with some other important artifacts related to the President's trip to Great Britain as he made his way from east to west to promote democracy across the continent that summer. While I believe that historians will always view his Westminster speech as one of the most important, what I found fascinating is the evolution of the words that came to fill the four corners of the document with such powerful ideas, ones that I am sure will outlive us all. We have placed right beside President Reagan's speech as delivered several previous drafts of his remarks, ones that originated from the Department of State and the White House speechwriters. Now, you'll find a version as well that contains the extensive handwritten notes, edits, additions, and deletions of President Reagan himself. One has to smile when they look upon the carefully written and forceful and knowing thoughts penned by the steady hand of Ronald Reagan as he set about the task of ensuring the speech said exactly what he wanted to convey. He spent a month working on the historic remarks. He traded draft after draft with staff who at varying times called upon the ideas of Madison, Jefferson, Lincoln, Churchill, Eisenhower, and Truman to evoke the images they were after. In the end, the speech was pure Ronald Reagan. You will be interested to know that in all the back and forth and all the competing voices as to what the president should say, the signature words, the signature call for a campaign for democracy survived every draft at President Reagan's insistence. One friend of the president's, an extremely bright and conservative intellectual he greatly respected, was asked to take a look at the speech before it was delivered. He cautioned the president that the idea for a permanent institute advocating global democracy was a dubious idea and not right for the speech nor the times. Well, the rest is history. President Reagan went with his instincts. The idea for the campaign for democracy survived. And with the help of a lot of people, many in this room, the movement thrived. 30 years later, his library has the honor of hosting all of you. I'm honored now to invite onto the stage Gerald Green, the President and CEO of the Pacific Council on International Policy, for a welcome. Well, good morning. I, I, um, I wonder how many of you noticed as, as we walked into the magnificent Reagan Library that there were arrows going in two directions. There was one you could come to the NED meeting, um, the other you could go and vote. And you can vote in, for Ventura County officials and others. And I thought the coincidence and the symbolism of that is overwhelming. Uh, we, we didn't plan the election to be today. <laughs> Uh, but I, it captures more eloquently than can I or anyone else exactly why we're here and who we wish could be, could be joining us. And, and I must say, given this event, I've been kind of reflecting on my, 
my own career as a, an academic political scientist, and I was thinking when I washed up on the shores of, uh, of Iran um, in 1978 as a young graduate student from the University of Chicago to do a dissertation on some extraordinarily trivial, arcane, but social scientifically very meaningful topic, and within a week changed my, my dissertation to a study of the Iranian Revolution, which none of my colleagues had predicted or really understood. And as we sort of think about democracy and what our colleagues from NED and NDI and IRI and other such organizations do, it's, it's overwhelming uh, the, the, the number of times we encounter uh, people struggling for and striving for precisely what they're trying to, to assist people in, in, um, in generating. Just a few remin reminiscences of my own. Uh, I was in South Sudan. Um, and the NDI office and the IRI office were together. One's the Democratic Public Party, one's the Republican Party. Frankly, you would not have known because they collaborated so meaningfully and effectively to help the people of, of South Sudan in, 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 in very difficult circumstances in the, in, in, in the task of uh, uh, nation building. Um, last week, believe it or not, I, I just came back from Myanmar with uh, Bill Loomis, who's a member of our board, and we were sitting in the American Embassy and meeting all manner of, of, of Burmese people three days ago. And we were minor celebrities because we knew people from NED. We knew people from NDI, and who was the new American ambassador to, to Myanmar once he's confirmed, an alum of, 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 of NDI and an alumni of this, of this world. So when we think of American exports, if we will, we think of biotech, we think of the film industry, we think of you know, all manner of, of consumer goods. But in a sense, the most precious thing, um, and I've come to realize this through, through, through the, you know, our gathering today and, and, and the ramp up for this, is precisely what's done by the National Endowment for Democracy um, and it's, 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 uh, the, or the other organizations that, that it sponsors. I'm, I'm truly honored and, and delighted that the Pacific Council can be part of, of, of this event. And I'm hard pressed to think of anything that we have ever done in our history, which I would like to think is, is, is long and distinguished, uh, which is approaches in importance, uh, what's going to be discussed today, and, 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 and bringing all of these, these, these organizations which uh, deal with the, the promotion of democracy uh, to California. And, and, and again, I really would like to welcome all of you uh, to California. I hope you will come again. Mr. President, it's, it's, it's a particular honor to, to have you uh, here in California. Uh, we think of ourselves as, a, as, as an undiscovered treasure, and uh, we certainly believe in democracy here. Um, so um, not that it always works as well as one might wish, but we, we do our best. And um, I want to turn the proceedings over to uh, my friend Carl Gershman and, and, and all of our very distinguished guests, and to thank John and the Reagan Library for its extraordinary hospitality. There's no better place to have a meeting of this sort. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, John, so much, and thank you, Jerry. I was thinking when Jerry was talking about just coming back from Burma that uh, the Reagan Westminster Address really had two ideas in it. One was that countries that were dictatorial, and he was talking about the communist countries at the time, but obviously there are other dictatorial countries in the world, would end, he said, on the ash heap of history, but that people would overthrow dictatorships, but then, and the, and the really important part of the speech, or the other important part of the speech, was the idea of building institutions, universities, uh, political parties, trade unions, and that's the work that takes place after a dictatorship falls on the ash heap. And, you know, when you were talking about Burma, uh, you know, in, we hope that the Burmese military dictatorship has now been put on the ash heap of history. We don't know. But we also know that the really, really difficult challenge lies ahead. Uh, how do you build democracy in a multi-ethnic country?
country that's so poor. I mean, this is going to be extraordinarily difficult, certainly as difficult as overthrowing or, or in this case, transitioning away from um, a dictatorship. We decided to organize this morning's discussion about the Reagan Address in two parts. One was to assess where we are after 30 years with democracy assistance. It's been quite extraordinary how this field has changed and grown. And then in the second session that Larry Diamond will chair with, with four activists, we're going to look at the struggle today uh, as activists see it on the ground. A lot of it will be this difficult problem of trying to build democracy after, uh, after dictatorship. And we're absolutely delighted this morning to have with us Madeleine Albright, uh, Secretary Albright, and, and uh, former Peruvian President Alejandro Toledo. Um, Madeleine Albright has been involved with the NED and in the struggle for democracy really for her whole life. Um, Sidney Hook once said that somebody who is devoted to democracy the way Madeleine Albright is, believes in democracy as a way of life, not as a political system, uh, but as a way of life. And I think in her, uh, in her books, um, her memoir of her time as Secretary of State, and her recent book, which I guess there's going to be a signing of this morning, Prague Winter, uh, she, she tells her own story, and it's quite a remarkable story. And she was involved with the NED uh, at the very, very beginning. Um, a lot of people don't realize this because I think we're pretty established today, but in the beginning we were extremely controversial. This was a new and very, very controversial idea, the idea of trying to work in other countries to support democracy. And we had challenges in the Congress, and I can remember Madeline coming to the NED in 1984, being at meetings around the table. How do we survive when we were being challenged in Congress? She was an early member of the uh, uh, NDI board and, of course, is now the chair of the NDI board. Uh, she was a member of the NED board. And then as Secretary of State, uh, in working with uh, the Polish Foreign Minister, Bronisław Goremek, uh, she created a new intergovernmental institution called the Community of Democracies, which had as its goal uh, the idea of democracies working together to share experience and to try to build, uh, build democracy together. Uh, I think as everyone knows, um, last week, Madeline was uh, presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the, our, the highest honor that can be given to a civilian in the United States. And uh, for being a champion of democracy, human rights, and good governance across the globe, and for that very reason, and for all that she's done for NED and for democracy and for NDI, uh, last night, we presented Madeline with the NED's uh, Democracy Service Medal. So it's really so wonderful to have her with us this morning. Now, I first met Alejandro at the founding of the Community of Democracies in Warsaw in June of 2000. I don't know if you met him at the That's time, but he, he was a, a political oppositionist at the time and also a dissident. Uh, Fujimori was the president of Peru at the time, and Alejandro came to Warsaw with a fellow named Baruch Ifsher, who uh, owns a television station that had investigated Fuji the Fujimori government, and it's uh, a fellow named Montesinos, who was the uh, intelligence chief, right? And even for, for, uh, for, for conducting death squads, uh, drug trafficking, and other real crimes. Uh, the Fujimori government wanted Ifsher arrested by Interpol, and we spent most of our time, I remember it, in June of 2000, trying to help them evade Interpol. He was a, you know, he was a dissident running away from Interpol, really, at that time. Uh, I mention that because just a few months later, videos came out exposing um, uh, Montesinos trying to bribe a congressman. Uh, Montesinos had to flee the country. Fujimori resigned, and in a few months, Alejandro was elected president, the first indigenous Peruvian ever to be elected president of the country, something quite extraordinary. And I think Madeline will realize the parallel with Václav Havel going from being a dissident, and then a couple of weeks later, he was president of, uh, of a new, newly democratic, newly liberated Czechoslovakia. Um, it's quite a remarkable thing. And we're also very happy to have Alejandro with us today because one of the things we tried to do last night at this dinner honoring uh, Madeline and 
Secretary Schultz, was to raise funds for something called the World Movement for Democracy, which is a global association of democratic activists. And the assembly of the World Movement is going to be held in Peru um, in October of this year, and so Alejandro will be one of our hosts. Um, let me just note that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zubilis of Lithuania, which held the chairmanship of the Community of Democracies until a year ago, uh, was supposed to be with us this morning. He was called away by uh, urgent parliamentary business. So we're going to start a discussion with Madeleine Albright, sort of talking about the challenges today um, and where we stand today after 30 years in this business of democracy yeah. assistance. Well, it's wonderful to be here, and Carl, thank you, and Alejandro, dear Mr. President. It's an honor to be here and very nice to be in this amazing uh, facility honoring a great president. I think that, if I might, begin in the following way, because the challenge is that this is a very long um, story, a long history that requires a lot of work. And you were kind enough to mention my book, and um, I basically begin with the role of Woodrow Wilson, who, in fact, was a great American president who thought that the world needed to be made safe for democracy. And I was born in a country that came about as a result of Woodrow Wilson's work in the 14 points and creating a democracy in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the Czechoslovak Constitution was modeled on the American Constitution with one major difference. It had equal rights language in it in 1918. Uh, and so it's interesting, the history uh, that Woodrow Wilson played in creating one of those small number of democracies that was discussed last night in terms of what happened in the interwar period. President Roosevelt obviously spent a lot of time in terms of thinking about how democracies could be defended against Hitler. President Truman uh, was somebody that spent a lot of time and money in terms of assistance programs to make sure that democracy was able to flourish uh, in Europe uh, after World War II. And what I'd like a bit about the story is the continuity of everything. I worked in the Carter administration. President Carter was the first one to put human rights as central to American foreign policy, which is then reflected in a lot of what President Reagan was talking about. Uh, Dante Fussell, uh, who was chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, was instrumental in working in order to create the National Endowment for Democracy. And so I have always liked the kind of bipartisan aspect of this and the evolution of the American story about supporting democracy and how it must have fit in with President Reagan's uh, editing of, of his speech and what he knew um, was going on. I have to tell you this story because I was in the, uh, uh, they had summoned the former secretaries of state to come to the, to, uh, uh, the last President Bush's meetings to talk about Iraq and President uh, Bush came in and said, we have to support democracy, and went on and on about supporting democracy, and I was trying very hard to be calm about a variety of things that I disagreed with, and as we're moving from one room to another, I said, Mr. President, I am so in favor of you saying we need to support democracy, but I want you act as if you invented democracy, when actually I did. And so, uh, uh, there's always, you know, who actually invented democracy, and it is what this country has been about, and, and I admire the presidents that have built on what the previous ones have done to understand that supporting democracy and human rights and a campaign for democracy is the goal of the United States. I fully believe that. So what I think comes out of the story is how difficult it is, actually and that um, it, democracy is not an event. Democracy is a process. And it is one that needs the support. I, I think your point about voting today is just brilliant, because that's what it's about, is the responsibility of citizens in terms of how they make their voices heard and how the process works, and what are the channels of making democracy work. What has, I think, been, when we started, when Ned was started, I was actually vice chair of the National Democratic Institute. <coughs> Chuck Manat, uh, a Californian, was chairman of the board. And to be frank, we did not have a clue what to do. Uh, all of a sudden, there were these party institutes. Our political parties are different from 
the European parties that had foundations that were associated with them. We didn't know. So we sat in meetings and we talked about what is democracy. And people said, well, democracy is elections. Yet, well, since I was an expert on the Soviet Union and I knew that you could get 99.9% .9 in an election, <laughs> uh, necessary but not sufficient. So we talked a lot about the elements and we actually decided that one of the major elements was the existence of an opposition party. Because an opposition party provides choice and requires accountability then from the people in power. I have been in the opposition, I have been in the governing party, the latter is more fun, but the bottom line is, is that you need that kind of thing to go on. And therefore, as we look at the evolution of democracy in a variety of places, I think we need to look at, as I mentioned last night, the channels of how you get from uh, mass movements of various kinds into governance. I believe in political parties. I think you need the rule of law, you need to have um, institutional structures, a free press, uh, and you need to have economic development. Uh, as a political scientist, I don't know how many times in classes you learn, does political development come first or does economic development come first? They clearly come together. And again, to repeat myself from last night, the bottom line is people want to vote and eat. And therefore, there has to be economic development that goes with it. And therefore, another aspect of democracy is trying to deal with corruption. So this is a very long story, and I think our issues here are how to keep attention on places that are not automatically, everybody talks about Jeffersonian democracy, I don't know how much of it we have here. So the bottom line is, is how we keep our eye on a process that is a very difficult one, but is the American story of helping democracies, not imposing democracy. And uh, you know, you, you raised the issue of the economy, and of course, a lot of people don't understand this about the NED. The NED has four institutes. Uh, everybody thinks of NDI and IRI, and that's what's known. But you know, in, in the founding of the NED, the, the largest of the four institutes was the Labor Institute because that was the uh, institution in America that was already active. The parties were new. And then there was also a, an institute associated with the chamber called the Center for International Private Enterprise, which works very much on the issue of corruption, corporate governance, and how to, uh, this is a very big issue. So I remember once, Madeline, you used the term full service package. Right. In other words, you have, it's not just a matter of working over the long time, but it's working with all the different aspects, including, of course, free media, NGOs, human rights organizations, civil society, and so forth. You mentioned um, you know, opposition, and of course, Alejandro, you were in an opposition. You were part of a protest movement. You had to make the transition from protest uh, to politics. And I'm wondering if you could say something about that and also maybe comment on what is the role of outsiders like ourselves? We're talking about democracy assistance. You, in the beginning, were a recipient. I mean, obviously the struggles are internal. Democracy has to come from within. But in your view, what is the role played by these institutions in the struggle in a country like Peru? First of all, Carol, thank you very much and it's a privilege to be with Michael Albright again. Speech last night made by President Ronald Reagan cut across political parties. There is no party color when you talk about the market. One of the greatest achievements of this country is have reduced the spectrum to a bipartition, which makes it a little more easier than competing with 20 candidates for a president in Peru. And I think that those values are very unrooted And Carol, for me, democracy does not have a nationality. Just as much human rights does not have 
skin color. I've been in the street. I've been a rebel with a headband. And I have 119 death threats on my life. One was just about to be executed, but they negotiated in Germany not to do it uh, between two agencies. I have been declared person non grata in Burma because uh, together with 26 former presidents, we decided to support this lady <laughs> who had been in jail. So they, I was in Thailand, I wanted to cross Burma, and I said, mm, they told me. Mm. I've been in a constant fight with President Hugo Chavez. My point, Carol, is that it's not sufficient to be free to go to, to vote in an election day. It is not sufficient to have institutions for whom I have a, a profound respect, such as the NET, the NDI. IRS, IRI. You have done an incredible job. Not to take literally what you people think. We have to do the adjustment to our own environment. But if they have to say something today is to pay tribute for those who have not only put institutions such as the NET, the NDI, IRI, but also have provided degrees of freedom for local institutions to work their own democracy, civil society. The Center for Democracy and the Rule of Law at Stanford it's something that teaches a lot because people come from different parts of the world, particularly for the summer. This, by the way, is a program run by Larry Diamond, who's going to be moderating the second session. And so, what is my point? Don't tell me how to do democracy in my country. Provide me the means, provide me the means that civil society practitioners could adequate democracy that goes beyond elections. That is a democracy that delivers concrete and measurable results. Because democracy without the distribution of economic growth, growth is very important, but growth is a mean, not an end. Peru is growing at an average since I took office over 89%. And poverty reduction has dropped 30%. But Carl, the averages hide much more than they reveal. Inequality has increased. Poverty has been reduced, but inequality has increased. And that is, how do we create a democracy that delivers concrete, immeasurable results that make sense for people who are hungry? My last point. As if I wouldn't have enough problem on my plate, I'm in, now involved in what's called the Arab Spring countries. Latin American for 50 years with the sources of trouble and discipline, dictatorship, hyperinflation. With all due respect, the 2008 2009 financial crisis was not produced by Latin America. And 
and I think you know where it was produced. And we pay part of the top. Latin American has learned something. And now we are not part of the problem, we're part of the solution. I'm taking 18 former presidents from Latin America to Tunisia to try to see how our own precarious experience of recuperating democracy could be of some help in the so-called Arab Spring countries, knowing that there are dramatically different realities. We are not going there to teach them how to do democracy, but rather to empower people. Now, there's a French philosopher who was with me in Jerusalem recently and said, Margaret, said, listen, just because dictators such as in Libya, in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunis, they have not created institutions to whom to be accountable just because we don't have a new leaders to take off, we should not be tolerating the dictatorships that are there. Just because we don't have institutions and new leaders to take on, we cannot continue supporting 47 years of a dictatorship in Libya. 46 years in Syria, father and son, or 24 year, years in Egypt. So you people have not taught us about democracy. You have shown us a path, and it's a, it's a process. We have not finished yet. In Peru, now we have economic growth, now we have democracy. Now we have to deliver concrete results for the poor in order for them to make sense democracy. Mentally, when uh, Alejandro speaks about the Middle East, um, it's a tough environment. Um, and it's going to be a difficult place to work. And I know NDI has had a lot of trouble there, and so is IRI. Is the world changing, Madeline? I mean, are we seeing a, a, a autocrats becoming more determined and more, under, you know, they understand what we do and more determined to resist democracy movements? Are they, are they going to be a, more of a problem for us in the future than they have been in the past? <clears throat> well, I, I, I am very worried about how to assess what is going on and how, in fact, one does the promotion of democracy because it goes to the points that Alejandro made, which is that we don't necessarily have to make it an American system of democracy in these places. What one has to do is provide um, the various Alejandros that are in those other countries with the tools, the nuts and bolts of democracy. Um, I think that that has been kind of the, um, the real signature aspect of how NDI operates, the NED, et cetera, in terms of not saying our way or the highway, but try to figure out what the best methods are. What we're seeing is in autocratic governments, uh, and this is a generalization, is that there is a linkage between the money in the countries and the governments in terms of controlling, uh, if one looks at the economic aspect of this, and they don't want to give up power. It is, it is not a matter of saying, okay, give up power for a while, you can come back next time. I mean, once they're out, they're out, and many of them are criminals, um, and therefore their questions about war criminals, I mean, or uh, so that their questions about whether they are indicted and where do they go, and a lot of issues that we had not dealt with before. I think that the hard part about what's happening in the Arab world, and I'll describe it in four sentences. I uh, was given in a discussion with an Arab in public. And I said, well, and this was this winter, and I said, well, we can't call it the Arab Spring anymore because it's the winter, and so why don't we call it the Arab Awakening? And he got furious at me, and he said, that's an insult. The Arabs haven't been asleep all this time. And I said, so what would you call it? And he said, I'd call it Arab Troubles. 
And I said, what about calling it Arab opportunities? So just in those sentences, you can see what the issue is. Um, and I think that there is uh, an aspect of it that makes it more complicated because of, I wrote a book about the role of God and religion in foreign policy. There is a religious aspect to this, some religious, some cultural, but that impact on it is something that we hadn't seen in previous countries. I think there is also the problem of fear of information because these have been systems that have been uh, controlled and censored in a variety of different ways. I think there is also a sense about cultural imperialism uh, and a whole set of issues that makes, makes it very different. Uh, Ken and I were talking earlier about this, is that there are countries where uh, we have in the past helped dissidents or opposition people create space in order to exist. And then there have been others where we have helped them use the space that exists. And at the moment, I think in the autocratic countries, because they're, some of them are semi-autocratic, is trying to figure out how you make the space and operate within it. And the rules are different. They are different. And I think that the violence that is associated with a lot of what's going on, the extremism that is, um, again, Alejandra, I agree with you on, in the world, there are fewer poor people by absolute numbers, but the gap between the rich and the poor is growing. And that gap is something that is very difficult for us to operate, how to deal with the, the divisions that are there created by the poverty, the anger created by the poverty. The, there is no uh, direct line between terrorism and poverty, but the bottom line is it creates a group of alienated people who are more than likely available for recruiting. So I think it's a very, very much more uh, complicated situation. If I might make one more statement, I know that you and Hernando de Soto don't always agree on things, <laughs> but one of the issues that he's brought up in terms of what hap has happened, primarily it began in Tunisia. The young man who immolated himself was not able to get enough money in order to buy his vegetables. His father had died, his mother could not inherit the property because of uh, discrimination against women inheriting property. So to a greatest extent, some of what's happened in the Arab awakening has to do with economic dignity. And so those issues going together and how they are a threat to an autocratic, autocratic regimes that have controlled the economy are all the things that make this much and, more difficult. And he was part of the so-called informal sector. It was not the legally protected. And that, I remember, in the beginning of NED, our business institute was working on this issue in Peru, which DeSoto worked yeah. on. And that was his book, The Other Path, as to how do you bring the protections of law to the informal sector so people could have contracts, they could have property rights. Otherwise, they're not going to take yeah. the risks necessary. Alejandro. Um, one of our friends in Egypt said that the most important thing they could learn from a country like Peru today is how do you bring the military under control? I mean, that's certainly the biggest problem in Egypt, but that's what they want to learn, I think, from Latin America. Could you say a word on how you did it in Peru and what you think Latin America has to uh, bring? You're going to have to bring the same lesson, I think, to a country like Burma. How do you bring the military under civilian control? It's a crucial issue. Fortunately, when I was elected president, the military were caught in bed with Fujimori and Montesinos. So they were not too powerful. So we have now 12 commander in chiefs in jail. That allowed me to announce the first year I took office to uh, cut 22% military spending and reorient it to education. Now, today in Peru we have a commander, a military commander president. But that was democratically elected. I participated in an election, and I lost. 
I didn't get into the second round. But I determined who the president was going to be. Now I'm in trouble because the commander president is having difficulties to sit in the presidential chair because he had no experience. He was just a commander like Hugo Chavez. And um, Hugo Chavez is, is losing influence, to put it mildly. And so he's now trying to practice democracy. For 50 years, Latin American region had had uh, military governments. And we have now almost all the continent, except one, who is a military. There are some people who put a mask of democracy to be elected. And then when, <coughs> once they are elected, they change the rules of the game to be re reelected. But, you know, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, Mayo, Argentina. But I think that we have gone a long way. And there is no threat, Carl, of military coup in Latin America. What can you tell, what can you tell our Arab friends? What lessons have you learned? You know, the Arab friends have a lot of money. But if industrialized country put the enough money, the courage, and the leadership to find a substitution for oil, then they will have to drink their oil. Because um, their power derives from there. And Margaret Albright is absolutely right. There is a relationship between authoritarianism and the Arab countries with religion. And I'm not going to evade the issue of Iran. Iran. You know, sometimes I think that the Jewish people are right when they say that they are the chosen ones. Be careful, Alejandro. <laughs> <laughs> I have half moral authority to talk about. <laughs> He's talking about his wife. <laughs> you know, God uh, created this tiny country surrounded by enemies. No water. And decided to bless them by not putting any natural resources in it. <laughs> We have a problem. We have a lot of natural resources. Gold, copper, silver, oil, gas. And although we have learned our economic lessons the last 50 years, we are still dependent on an, in an exogenous factor. The price of our commodities in the international market are very high with an incredible recomposition in the region. Latin America, uh, the United States is no longer the main investor in Latin America. The United States is no longer the main trade partner of Latin America. The main investors are the European Union, mainly England and Spain. And the main trader is China. And China is a bulldozer. They just come with an incredible amount of money. I go to my point of democracy that delivers. Our problem that we have now is that we are growing as a region 6%, as a Peru 8%, 
10 consecutive years. It began with me, but I have to admit that all the presidents continue to, the growth. But we are not delivering, and that is undermining democracy. One additional point. Lack of distribution is undermining democracy because people are upset. Listen on the television every night that we are one of the highest growing countries in the region, and yet they don't feel in their pocket. And secondly, mining are creating a problem in their environment and the water. And third, so yes, democracy is fine, but I want a democracy in which I can express an idea that differs from the government. I want a government that has strong democratic institutions that are accountable for what they do. If we don't mix democracy with the liberty, with improving life conditions, and by the way, there is a strong correlation between poverty and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. If we are done, then people become the solution. Once again, natural endowment for democracy, NDI, IRI, have done an incredible job not to be a paternalistic, that's perhaps what I respect the most. I met Margaret Albright in Warsaw when I was in the middle of the street with a headband fighting for democracy, not running for an election. That came afterwards. And so my view over here is the Latin America in the next 10 to 15 years is the most promising continent in the world. Uh, I partner, I beg you to forgive my lack of uh, modesty. <laughs> but it is coming. It's the combination of natural resources. It's the combination of human resources that is in a diaspora in the world. But if we are intelligent enough to recuperate them, then we can consolidate it. And let me tell you, democracy is not going back 50 years where we came from. Uh, we've been uh, joined since we began by NED's chairman, Dick Epphart. Welcome, Dick. It's wonderful to have you. And also, Alejandro was just speaking about NDI and IRI, and we have with us this morning the presidents of these two uh, important organizations, uh, Ken Wallach, who's the president of NDI, and Lauren Crane is sitting next to him, who's the president of IRI. I wonder, you know, I want to open it up to uh, the audience if any of them would like to uh, make a point or raise a question. Uh, and I think we have a roving mic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, who, would, who would like to uh, maybe begin the discussion? Ken, you always have something to say. <laughs> I'll argue with um, I, I have a question for President Toledo. Um, I think people, and maybe some in this room, mistakenly believe that democracy promotion is an American enterprise. And I think what has evolved over the last 30 years is that this has become an international uh, enterprise. Uh, other governments, uh, non-governmental organizations overseas, and very importantly, intergovernmental organizations, led since 1989, uh, by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, and the OAS. Um, and the OAS, since it dropped its non-intervention clause, I think has played an extremely important role in protecting fragile democratic institutions in the hemisphere. And I know in Peru in 2000, the special mission, the OAS mission led by uh, Eduardo Stein of Guatemala played I think a historic role in nurturing the transition in Peru. There has not been a similar mission um, since then. Um, 
And people now are claiming the OAS is not playing its proper role in enforcing the Democratic Charter. And so the question, Mr. President, what do you think about the OAS role? Has it weakened? The Human Rights Commission of the OAS now is supposedly being, uh, uh, being weakened. Uh, what is your assessment of the role of the OAS now and what can be done to strengthen the Democratic Charter so this becomes a region-wide effort by the Latin Americans themselves to protect those institutions in the hemisphere? Ken, it's a crucial question. If you allow me, let me just put a footnote before I answer your question. I want to pay tribute to one of the guys who was, life was dedicated to help Latin Americans strengthen their democracy. Chevalier, who died in Egypt, in uh, Haiti. I was, uh, on September 11, 2001, I was in the palace um, three months after taking off office with Secretary of State Colin Powell. And he asked for a bilateral, so I invited him for breakfast. And I knew he liked uh, bacon, so I eggs and bacon, and we were 8, 10 in the morning. And the reason why we got together in Peru because it was, was the signing of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And all of a sudden I received a paper from my collaborators saying that an accident took place in New York. The plane had hit one of the towers, the Twin Towers. And he also received another paper. And we continued on. And then came another paper. So it was not an accident anymore. And we know September 11. So September 11 is the date in which the Inter-American Democratic Charter was uh, signed by all the states, including the United States and Canada. And that's really the rules of the game for Latin America in terms of democracy. You are putting me on the spot, and I'm glad you you are. With all due respect, the OAS is now much to be desired. Moreover, if you allow me, the United States did not do their enough job to restructure the composition of OAS to implement the Democratic Charter. The OAS that played a role in the 2000 with uh, Lord Axworthley is dramatically different from what it is today. So now that we are creating other institutions that is trying to substitute the OAS role. And so in the foundations that you know, Carol, we are creating a monitoring of the quality of democracy with an early signs that something could be happening in the region. Ecuador, for example, with respect to the press. And so there's much to be done, Ken, at the OAS, because there are other institutions that are emerging because of the lack of efficacy of today's OAS. They are trying to create other institutions 
excluding Canada and the United States. I'm not saying this because we need the United States to teach us how do, should we behave or implement democracy. Because what uh, the net is doing is promoting grassroots. And we are going to feel it in this October with the meeting of the World Movement for Democracy. And I'm going to persuade President Umala to come to inaugurate this movement. He's a military. He was a man who was close to Hugo Chavez. And the challenge is to bring it to the night of the inauguration to say something about democracy. Well, let's hope he also says something about the OAS, because I think uh, Secretary General Insulza could use a message of that kind from Mr. Umala. Madeline, is, is Europe, is, how is Europe doing? I mean, Ken is talking about Latin America and the OAS. Is, is Europe stepping up to the plate? Uh, no. Uh, um, I mean, I think that what is very interesting is um, an attempt to create a new set of institutions in Europe, and they are in a crisis. There's no question. And we were taught, you mentioned about ethnicity. I think in many different ways, when people are in trouble, usually economically, they decide they need a scapegoat. And so they then, in fact, begin to create uh, ethnic groups, it's very good to be proud in whatever group you come from. It's another is when your pride becomes hate of another group. And I do think there's concern. I think also what is very important to think about is, and it goes with the theme of what we started talking about here, this is a very long process. And, it, and democracy is not linear. Uh, there are ups and downs depending upon whether people feel that their governments are in fact delivering to them on a series of whether the social contract is fair, um, how the country is operating with its neighbors. And so there are very long stories here. And in Central and Eastern Europe, that where I come from, but where there was great sense of pride about things that were happening, I think that there are disappointments in terms of democracy. And uh, we were talking about this earlier, I am particularly disappointed in what's happened in Hungary. Hungary was a leader in democratic movements. Uh, Viktor Orban was one of the people that Ned worked with, NDI worked with, IRI worked with. He was kind of the uh, symbol of the young dissident who then was part of a youth party. It was interesting, they changed their charter when they got over 35 themselves. Uh, but more seriously, was the fact that he has become a hyper-nationalist. And in order to keep what he thinks is his mandate, he has begun to be very aggressive in terms of Hungarians that live both in Slovakia and in Romania. And there's a real question as to how they are working on their press laws and a variety of issues. And I mention it not to be, although I've just been very critical of Hungary, but to explain the difficulty of the ups and downs in this, in this, the understanding that these are very long processes. Um, and I think the governments are being put generally under stress in a number of different ways. I think part of the problem with the economic situation in Europe is that the various treaties that put together the European Union and the Eurozone were never tested with the public. I think there was a real lack of coordination in terms of uh, putting out a, a way that the, these were democracies that did not really consult their people about changing a, a whole system. And so I do think that the, they are, you know, obviously will stay democracies, but there are bottom line, I think, some very serious I, issues. I just, maybe you could pick up on that point a little bit more. They will stay democracies. How worried are you? I mean, a lot of people feel that autocratic countries, they have to do well economically because they have no other legitimacy. Democratically elected governments have legitimacy. But a lot of organizations, Legatum, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, have come out with studies recently saying that since the economic crisis of 2008, democracy is really under stress in Europe. How worried are you? Well, you know, people ask me, am I a pessimist or an optimist? I say I'm an optimist who worries a lot. So. Um, I am worried. What, 
but they're very, I think that democracy is embedded in Western Europe. I really do believe that. I think that there are, and deep down, depending upon the countries, I think that there is a depth of democratic feelings in other parts of Europe. What I'm worried about a little bit is the appointment of technocrats all of a sudden instead of politicians. I happen to like politicians. One of them is sitting here. Uh, 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 they are people who actually do the work of the population, of, of translating. And what has happened is when politicians are completely discredited and then you have a bunch of technocrats taking over, uh, I think there is a long-term problem. But, but I have to say I am not deeply worried about democracy continuing in Europe. I think it's going to go through troubled times. Uh, and the issues have to do with trying to find a scapegoat, uh, some of the immigration issues that come out. We certainly saw that in the French elections. He happened to have lost. But the bottom line is that there were a lot of scapegoatism uh, going on. But there are issues. Our problems are not Europe, Carl. Our problems are in the Arab world, where we have very serious issues that we have to deal with. I'm very encouraged by what Alejandro is saying about Latin America. I, I really do think that that is very clear, to, that uh, the combination of, of changes there are, are very um, encouraging in many different ways. We have problems in Africa, and we have problems in Central Asia, and I do think that that is where our focus needs to be. And I think we have to figure out the following thing is patience. I, it, it always takes me a while to get around to criticizing the press. But the bottom line is the way that the Arab Spring was covered by the media was not a favor to anybody. Yesterday, um, you quoted um, President Reagan and also George Shultz about democracy not being a spectator sport. It was covered. Tahrir Square was covered as if it were a spectator sport with a time limit. I'm, I shouldn't use sports analogies, but not even a game that had overtime in it. You know, I think it is a marathon. It is going to take a long time. It is going to require American and attention from other parts of the world, and we're going to see disappointments, but it is going the right direction, but it's going to be a very long story and not typically American of kind of checking off a box, done, move on. It is a long story. Dick. Dick Gephardt. <laughs> Can we bring your mic down for Chairman Gephardt? Thanks so much, and thanks to all three of you for doing this event today and for all of you being here. My question to both of you is, um, I've become concerned that we don't have uh, enough NEDs uh, across the world. Now, uh, last night we did some work for the movement for world democracy, which I take it is a, an organization that meets periodically, and that to me is a very hopeful thing. But do you think we have in place uh, enough effort by great people like the, the former president uh, and others. I know he says he goes and travels with other former leaders of democracy and does, I guess, expositions in places that are trying to reach democracy. But here, here, my simple thought is that I, I don't know that there's an effective enough world effort to to educate and to bring the information about how hard this is, what an evolution it is, what a process it is, how it includes both politics and economics, all the things you've said. Is there an organization that exists or should exist that could use the social media, YouTube, all these other modern means of communication to better inform people about how to do this day to day in various forms of evolution that all these countries are in. Everybody's different, every country's different, and they require a different curriculum, if you will, 
and it has to be delivered not just by the United States and Ned, but by people all across the world that believe in democracy. Well, Madeline, it's 12 years since the uh, community of democracies was established. Does it have the potential to do something well, of what Dick's talking about? It's interesting. I mean, we established the community of democracies um, in order to do what you're talking about, is basically for democracies to share experiences, best practices, and not be just an American operation. In fact, it was established in Warsaw. It was very interesting. We had we started out with the Warsaw Declaration, and Bronislaw Goremek said he wanted it called the Warsaw Declaration in order to have Warsaw as an adjective attached to something other than pact. Um, and so it was very important, signed by uh, most countries there, not France, by the way, uh, which was a point of uh, some dispute. But the bottom line is it was supposed to do that. It is alive and well. It has countries that, in fact, uh, are supporting it, that are um, work with it and operate. It is going to meet, and this is an issue. It's going to meet in Mongolia next time. The question is, whatever Mongolia is going through, is it actually using the community of democracies? That is one part. There are other organizations. The question is, if I can be frank here, is whether they compete and, or cooperate and how they uh, don't duplicate themselves. So there's the Madrid, um, the heads of state process that uh, deploys people to go to various places. There are the German Stiftungs, there's the Westminster process, et cetera. I don't know whether there's a way to coordinate them better. What I think we need to do, and you mentioned this already, and Secretary Schultz mentioned it last night, we have not figured out how the social media fits into this. If you think about it, social media is the most democratizing thing that is out there. Uh, and yet the question is, what are its responsibilities? How do how is it used? I mean, uh, when I was in office, we began more on the public diplomacy aspect. But is it, what is the difference between public diplomacy and propaganda? So there are lots of issues and questions out there. And I think it's worth examining whether it's good to coordinate everybody or whether, you know, let 100 flowers bloom. I don't know the answer, but there are other organizations. And the question is how to make them work together. Who would elect the coordinator? Yeah, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's also worth noting that the uh, European Union is in the process of creating something called the European Endowment for Democracy, which is, you know, it's an uh, effort to do something like what we have, and it would be very good. Yeah. I'm getting signals from a lot of the people in the audience that we have to break because the second session, they have to mic up the people. We're going to only break for five or ten minutes. Um, and then we're going to reconvene, and then we're going to hear from activists um, about uh, the struggle, a kind of a different look at the situation. But I want to uh, just thank uh, really two great Democrats. I, I think both of them fit, it, it live for democracy as a way of life. Um, and I know Alejandro has put his life on the line. Ma Madeline has given her life to this struggle. And uh, we're just very, very honored to have both of them. Can with I us just this make a point? I think that. Hats off to somebody who actually has had death threats against him, who really, those of, we talk about right. it, he did it. And I think that I am in great admiration of the kind of work that President Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.